Hi, welcome to the Lisa Saunders Show. Today I want to talk to you about how you can prevent congenital CMV, which is cytomegalovirus, from happening to your baby or somebody else's baby. I am the parent representative of the Congenital CMV Foundation because I found out the hard way how to prevent congenital CMV. It was too late for my daughter, Elizabeth, who was born in 1989. That's her with her big sister, Jackie. Um, when I first saw Elizabeth, my first thought was her head looks so small, so deformed. I was really quite terrified, actually. Um, the doctor, after doing a CAT scan, he found uh, extreme damage throughout her brain, calcium deposits fluid, and it was confirmed through a blood test that she had had congenital cytomegalovirus. I caught a virus um, and passed it on to her. Now, what is CMV? You need to know about this um, because most OBGYNs don't tell, warn their patients about it. CMV, or cytomegalovirus, is a common virus. Most infections with CMV are silent, meaning most people don't ever show symptoms. Um, some do show flu-like symptoms. I never had symptoms when I was pregnant. I had no idea I was sick. I felt a little tired at times, but I just thought that was being pregnant. Uh, this is who it harms. It, uh, CMV harms unborn babies. Uh, it may cause severe and occasionally life-threatening disease in immunocompromised persons, meaning people with a weakened immune system, such as organ and bone transplant recipients, cation, cancer patients, patients receiving immunosuppressant drugs, and HIV-infected patients. How is H, uh, uh, CMV spread? Um, mostly through saliva and urines, uh, spread through kissing, uh, like a pregnant woman should not kiss her toddler around the mouth or share cookies with them. I didn't know that. Um, you know, because you get the saliva on your hands, you might rub your eyes. Uh, it's in, through breast milk, but it's not really going to hurt a baby once the baby's born to catch uh, cytomegalovirus, then it's really okay for them. Um, Blood transfusions and organ transplantations can cause the spread of CMV. Um, you can avoid CMV by washing your hands carefully and thoroughly. Uh, they recommend usually 20 seconds, uh, 20, 30 seconds using soap and water, a disinfectant. Um, talk to your doctors about how you can prevent it. Um, people in daycare centers, they're a little bit higher risk for catching uh, cytomegalovirus uh, because 75% of children in daycare, young toddlers, are carrying the virus. Uh, apparently, nurses are not at high risk for catching it because they are washing their hands all the time, wearing gloves. They're not kissing their patients around the mouth. Um, it's not that kind of, you know, high touching involved with nurses and their patients. Um, my personal CMV story was that on, um, I had a miscarriage Christmas Eve of 1988. Uh, I was offered no blood test to see why I had a miscarriage. One of the reasons could have been because I had an active cytomegalovirus infection. I got pregnant three months later and was very happy looking forward to what lay ahead because Elizabeth was due on Christmas Eve, which was the, you know, exactly a year from when I lost the baby. Um, but she arrived on December 18th, and as I said before, I was shocked by how small her head was. Um, she had purple blotches uh, on her face and cheeks. She had difficulty breathing, and she was diagnosed with congenital CMV. Um, of course, I was in a lot of shock um, at what happened. My husband just kind of looked at her. He was like Charlie Brown with that pathetic Christmas tree. He said, oh, she needs me. She's all hooked up to monitors and everything. Um, so he was able to accept this and move on right away. It was tougher for me, but I did eventually outgrow my horror over it because, of course, I loved her so much. Um, symptoms of congenital CMV, temporary ones are liver problems, jaundice, lung problems, small size at birth, permanent symptoms or disabilities, which are, Elizabeth had all of these, which are hearing loss, vision loss, mental disability, lack of coordination, seizures, uh, and ultimately death. The CDC compares the causes of birth defects in this chart here. Cytomegalovirus causes more long-term medical conditions than fetal alcohol syndrome, than Down syndrome, than spina bifida. 
Um, and as Elizabeth grew, she was profoundly mentally impaired, uh, severe cerebral palsy. She never could hold up her head by herself. She had a progressive hearing loss. She was cortically blind. She couldn't speak. She had apnea. Um, she stayed about a three-month-old developmental level. Um, but despite it all, like I said, I just loved her. She loved to cuddle. She loved her family. Um, this is me just thoroughly enjoying her. But I am worried in this picture because it was right before we were going to have surgery for her. Because of her cerebral palsy, she needed to have hip surgery, spinal fusion surgery, um, assorted surgeries to keep her from being so tight and her spine from getting any more twisted than it was. Um, but despite all that, she grew up and had a very happy little life. As she's here with her big sister, Jackie. Elizabeth had this cart that her grandfather built for. He was a carpenter, helped her kind of scoot around. And she was daddy's little girl. I'd dress her up in tutus, and she'd put on little ballet performances with him being her partner, spinning her around and all that. Um, this is Elizabeth, about age four. She's in a dress her aunt made here in this picture. Um, Again, she couldn't see well. She was cortically blind, but she loved nose-to-nose -nose interaction. If she could, she loved looking at people up close. Um, she loved going to school. She worked hard. She had special equipment at school. Um, she had great teachers who would try to just help her keep limber. That was her problem, very tight muscles. She loved being in her stroller, going for long rides. Uh, she just loved life very much despite you know the disabilities and some of the surgeries and seizures she thoroughly enjoyed being alive and we enjoyed her one problem was loneliness for her um, you know she wasn't the first on every kid's birthday party list but she had um, she fi a dog finally came to her life our older daughter kept asking for a dog and I said well you know I was so worried about a puppy hurting Elizabeth by nipping at her feet, dangling over the couch and all that. But I t kept telling Jackie, well, if God brings a dog to our door, you can have it. And years went by, but God does have a sense of humor. And a dog eventually did come to our door, and he kept Elizabeth great company. Um, in the meantime, Elizabeth enjoyed typical things like slumber parties with her big sister, Jackie. Um, Jackie used to love to sleep with her. I was warned that maybe that wasn't such a good idea because Elizabeth could pass away in the night. She did have sleep apnea um, and seizures, but I, Jackie didn't mind. She said, no, I just I want to sleep with her. It's fun, you know, and it was great because Elizabeth loved the company. Um, and here's a picture of Elizabeth at age 15. Uh, she and Jackie and her parents and I, um, excuse me, us <laughs> and my parents, we went to New Jersey to the boardwalk and that was our last family vacation. Um, and several months later, I dropped Elizabeth off at school. She was 16 by that time. I dropped her off at school. I strapped her in her wheelchair. I held her face in my hands. I kissed her cheek and said, be a good girl today. And she laughed because her teacher said what she always said. Well, Elizabeth's always a good girl. And with that, I left. Uh, but at the end of the day, I got that phone call that I'd always dreaded. Um, Mrs. Saunders, Elizabeth had a seizure, and she's not breathing. Uh, I met her at the hospital, um, and they, you know, they tried everything she could, but she was gone. My husband met me there, came straight from work. Um, and we just took turns holding Elizabeth for a couple hours, actually, because it was hard to believe that she was really gone. Um, she looked asleep to me. But her eyes were partially open and looked lifeless. And my husband looked down at her and said, nobody's ever going to look at me that way again, um, which is, I thought, pretty much sums it up. Um, and then she did start, we were finally able to leave her at the hospital because she did start looking, she didn't look like herself anymore. Um, so I really knew her spirit had left her body. Um, and we buried her, um, got plots for all of us now, because what we all want to be to get buried together after she's, you know, after we go. And um, here's a stone that we had made. It, it kind of describes a lot of things that uh, some of the, the dove in the story on the on her stone is from a story my father wrote about her, a fairy tale. Um, we put under the stone our little girl, forever sweet sixteen. And on the back of her stone, I put something that used to really cheer me up. Um, 
The one relief to me is that she wasn't having any more seizures and wasn't suffering anymore. Um, but the pain of missing her, of course, was overwhelming. But I had these scriptures inscribed on the back of her stone, which really helped me. It said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And another scripture, then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Um, and it, so that just helped me, remind me that she was no longer lame. She was and is leaping for joy until I see her again. Um, now that I was no longer consumed with her care, I started thinking about, well, do women, or have they been warned yet about how to prevent this from happening to them? Um, and I looked at the literature, and I was shocked that it causes more disabilities than Down syndrome. And I thought to myself, uh, and I saw a report only 22% of women have heard of it, um, a report that was done the year Elizabeth died in 2006. And I had a very vivid dream of sitting in a support group with all these par young parents with children born like Elizabeth, who were all very, very young. And they, wanted to, they were each giving their story. And it was my turn to tell my story. And I thought, how can I tell them that I've known about uh, congenital CMV for years? And in fact, when I gave a talk later on um, congenital CMV, a mother got up later and just said to the audience, you knowing about congenital CMV, why haven't you shout, shouted it from the rooftops? And I thought, I have tried, and doctors, some doctors really do try, and so does the CDC, so does many organization. Um, the CDC sh chart shows CMV awareness, and 22% of women uh, at the top, you'll see they know about that versus other diseases that more a higher percent of women know about it. Um, why don't OBGYNs warn about CMV? Um, well, according to one study, less than half, 44 percent of OBGYNs warn their patients. Um, many don't want to frighten their patients. One is quoted in Fit Pregnancy as saying, quote, the list of things we're supposed to talk about during women's first visit could easily take two hours and, and scare them to death. Many um, doctors don't realize the prevalence of congenital CMV because, like I said, it doesn't have symptoms for most, in, in most cases anyway. In an article called uh, Washing Our Hands of the Congenital Cytomegalovirus Disease Epidemic, doctors Cannon and Davis state the virtual absence of a congenital CMV prevention message has been due in part to the low profile of congenital CMV infection excuse me, infection is usually asymptomatic in both mother and infant, and when symptoms do occur, they are nonspecific. So most CMV infections go undiagnosed. According to the CDC stats, every hour congenital CMV causes one child to become disabled. Each year, 30,000 children are born with congenital CMV infection. About 8,000 of those suffer permanent disabilities caused by CMV. About 1 in 150 children is born with congenital CMV. About 1 in 750 children is born with or develops permanent disabilities due to CMV. Um, and again, like I said, pregnant women can catch uh, CMV through saliva and urine of young children. That's the majority of causes for women who already have a child and then their second child is born with it, that's probably where they got it, especially if their toddler is in a daycare setting. But it doesn't mean that it's hopeless. You can prevent yourself by ca from catching it by just not kissing them around the mouth. Don't share a cookie with them. Wash your hands after you pick up toys. Um, like I said, the, uh, reduce, you can reduce your chances by washing your hands in soap and water for 15 to 20 seconds using disinfectant if you don't have access to soap. Again, don't share food, drinks, or utensils. Um, one thing to note, it only lasts on surfaces for 30 seconds, so you can prevent yourself from catching this. If you're considering getting pregnant, you may want to check your CMV status to see if you've ever had it before, and that's a simple blood test. Um, daycare workers, I do, uh, the CDC says adults who have who have not had CMV and who work with children in daycare, especially children one to two and a half years of age, are at high risk for CMV infection. So you may want to consider working with children who are older if you can. Otherwise, really use those precautions. 
Um, my effort to shout CMV prevention from the rooftops, um, one of them is through my book, Anything But a Dog, which is the story of Elizabeth and her pets and her big sister. It's a lighthearted memoir. It's not meant to be depressing. It's just because, like I said, Elizabeth had a great life with her big sister and a series of dysfunctional pets until this dog showed up at our door. And this dog became a wonderful companion. It's actually, there's a twist in the story. It's not quite the dog that came to the door, but this puppy led us to another one that did become her companion for the last five years of her life. Um, he was uh, a dog from a shelter who weighed about 100 pounds. She weighed about 50 pounds. So they were quite a, quite a contrast sitting on that couch. Neither one of them could do anything. Um, they couldn't change the channels on the TV set or anything else. He could, he did, the dog didn't know how to play with toys. Elizabeth couldn't play with toys, but they kept each other company. Um, he would lay on her feet. She, her feet would turn purple from lack of um, good circulation, and he would just lay on them, keep them warm. Sometimes he even would jump down and alert me if she was having a seizure. Um, so she did have a very happy life, like I said. And I used to make up fairy tales. There's a fairy tale I include in the, in the book about an adventure they had with an old railroad, uh, with a, an old grandpa train. Um, so, like I said, I, she had a life. There's my story about it. And it does raise awareness at the end. I do have uh, quotes from the leading CMV doctors in the country and ways that can, uh, people can prevent CMV. Uh, I go to conferences and speak about congenital CMV. Um, they're sponsored by the CDC and sometimes by others. Um, I am pictured here with uh, a friend of mine who, who formed a foundation, Stop v CMV. She was pregnant with twins when she caught cytomegalovirus. So imagine what I went through twice. Um, that is the hardest thing for me to do, is to go to those conferences with children who are young. Because I think if I had just done something more, maybe those parents would have known how not to contract CMV. Um, um, and things are slightly changing. More information is getting out. Uh, but it is a painful thing to look at children and know that maybe you could have said something to prevent that. Uh, another book that I wrote that raises CMV prevention message is uh, The Fairy Tale, Surviving Loss, The Woodcutter's Tale. It's available as a free ebook, and it is available in soft cover. My sister-in-law, uh, Elizabeth's aunt, illustrated it. I think it's beautiful, and it's the fairy tale my father felt inspired to write after Elizabeth died, and it really helped me, and I think it will help other parents who have lost somebody who suffered um, or have a friend that suffered. So I do recommend it. It is a free ebook. You can go to my website to download it. And that's again uh, www.author.lisasaunders.com. I even raise a CMV prevention message in my book called Mystic Seafarer's Trail. That book I wrote about. Uh, the area that I live in, which is Mystic, Connecticut. It's, an, it's a humorous historical adventure guide, I guess. It's me trying to get thin and famous like Amelia Earhart, who got married in the Mystic area. She actually got married in Noank uh, in a secret wedding. And I joke that I want to get thin and famous like her because she used her fame to raise awareness for women's rights. And I want to use my fame, if I ever get some, <laughs> to raise a CMV prevention message. Um, you know, like if a movie star got on this topic, everybody would listen to them. Um, so I try one adventure after another. Many of them became misadventures. Um, one of them was even kind of a crazy winter sailing voyage that I took. Um, but anyway, I had a lot of fun writing it, met a lot of exciting, interesting people. But I don't even tell people until chapter seven why I'm trying these crazy adventures, um, because I want people to realize this is a fun book. Um, that's all I know to do, to try to attract people so that they'll get, they'll absorb the message until OBGYNs make telling their patients this a standard practice of care. Now, ways you can stop CMV is learn the facts. Go to the CDC website, which is very clear, has great facts, and everybody will believe you when you say, I got it from the CDC website. Of course, just tell your friends and family about CMV. 
uh, my blog, which um, you can get to my website. It's too hard to give you all these names. You can go from my website. You can find my blog. I have a lot of posters linked to it, little flyers. Um, you can write to magazines and newspapers. If you ask, or write a letter to the editor, people actually read letters to editors. So I suggest doing that. You know, why, why don't OBGYNs make this a standard practice of care? Um, I have sample letters on my website that you can use. Um, talk to newspapers and TV. Say, I'm willing to be interviewed. Um, I know a parent who is affected by it. I know a doctor who works with it. Um, create the stories yourself. Uh, my latest thing that uh, I've been doing is I contacted my local representative. I said um, the state of Utah just passed a bill requiring their health department to have CMV education. Um, and so uh, that is now being proposed in the state of Connecticut. So if you live in Connecticut, uh, I urge you to contact the members of the Public Health Committee and say you support this bill. Again, you can look at this bill on my website or go to the State of Connecticut website and look for this bill. Um, you can start in your own state, uh, ask your representative see, um, that say the state of Utah has passed a bill requiring education and, and send them a link to that bill so that it gives them a format to follow. Um, another way you can raise CMV prevention message is I have a flyer that's from Stop CMV that I think is a, a very good flyer. You can just, it's one page. You can print it out, ask doctors to post it in the bathroom stalls um, for people to read it, and hand it out or give the link to people um, so they can download it and, and hand it out. Uh, you can join forces with others. These are um, the following organizations I work with, the National Congenital CMV Disease Registry, um, the Congenital CMV Foundation, of which I am the parent rep. The, um, these doctors that founded it and run it are very helpful when I need quotes, when I need help. Um, they give me things to do. The other organization, Stop CMV and the CMV Action Network, again, that's a parent-run organization. Another parent-run organization is the Brendan B. McGinnis Congenital CMV Foundation. All these foundations do things to raise awareness. Now, if you're pregnant with an active CMV infection, um, I do get contacted about that. And you would find out that you had an active one if you got a blood test. Um, you would contact the National Congenital CMV Disease Registry, and they would help hook you up to the right doctors who are trying some treatments. Um, you would contact experts at the Texas Children's Hospital Fetal Center for advice. Um, these are all, this is all information that I'm giving on that PowerPoint that you're seeing, but you can see my PowerPoint right on my website. Uh, so you don't have to worry about writing all of this down. Uh, because there are some treatments for pregnant women being tried with some promising results. CMV hyperimmune globulin is being tried. Um, there's also a study underway for that. Uh, babies, if they know that they have CMV when they're born, not all babies are tested for it. This is something that people would wish would happen. If they know they have it, they're trying gan gancyclovir on them. Uh, again, you would want to talk to your doctor, of course, about this. But these are some of the advantages of being tested um, because it does cause hearing loss. My daughter didn't really have a hearing loss at first, but then she's gradually started losing her hearing loss. Now, in summary, uh, this is a good slide from the CDC just showing, again, uh, the causes of some birth defects. And a quote from there is, perhaps no single cause of birth defects and developmental disabilities in the United States currently provides greater opportunity for improvement outcomes in more children than congenital CMV. So again, I encourage you to go to my website, author, www.authorlisasaunders.com. I have all kinds of information that I can send you to um, from that site that will send you to these organizations I work with, the CDC sites, all that. I'm willing, if you live uh, local in Connecticut, I'm happy to come to your group. Um, you can show this. I'm going to. Uh, get this on YouTube. You can show this to people if you'd like. I do speak um, at all kinds of organizations, nurses, again, um, conferences. You can play this or uh, contact other parents if you'd like to find out parents in your state if you need them local. The organizations I work with have lists of parents willing to be contacted by the media or willing to do talks. 
Um, again, and, and it's not the end of the world um, what happened to us, but it is obviously a sadness. I wish my daughter could have been prevented from going through this, and I hope that your children or your families that you know never have to go through this. It can't until there's a vaccine. Um, there's no 100% way to make sure you don't contract it, but there are ways, and studies do show that when you really watch your hygiene on the washing hands, I'm sure I picked up toys and then grabbed an apple and ate it without thinking. Um, so your mother was right. Do wash your hands before you eat. Um, and I don't know what else I should say to you unless you have specific questions and we ever could do a show again, have a call-in show. Um, I just like to show another picture of Elizabeth and her sister, just to talk about them again. If you want to show the picture uh, that we showed a, a begin at the beginning of Elizabeth and her big sister Jackie, um, I have a lot of happy memories of raising my girls. Jackie was a great big sister to her, um, and I do have, like I said, just happy memories. I try not to think about Elizabeth's suffering because that's a bit too much to bear, and especially. It's hard for me to think about that it could have been, that the suffering part for her could have been prevented had I known. Um, I ran a licensed daycare center in my home. Um, this is when I lived in Maryland, and nowhere that I recall anyway in the licensing literature did I see information on how to prevent congenital CMV um, in a daycare setting. So I think daycare information is very important. I wish all daycare centers around the country had a little sign posted about CMV. Um, so pregnant women p would picking their children up or dropping them off would just be mindful about washing their hands and that daycare workers would be mindful about washing their hands, washing the toys. Um, there are websites you can look at how to disinfect toys because you just want to keep things as clean as possible. Um, another thing I wish uh, pediatricians would, when they're seeing the babies, when women come in with their newborns, I wish they would tell, have information there in a doctor's office um, about, that. just think about when you get pregnant for your, your next child, be careful with this child's saliva um, and kissing around the mouth because that is how a lot of the infection is passed. Um, but that's about it. But thank you so much for watching. Please uh, share this information with your groups and with any, anybody you love. And again, thank you for coming and watching The Lisa Saunders Show.